Hello, this is Dustin Russell from SustainAnation.com. Today we have a very special guest joining us for a fantastic event here. Today we're here with Daniel Vitalis. Daniel is founder of Sir Thrival. He is also a leading health, nutrition, and sustainability strategist. Today we're here going to be talking about spring water and uh, how to find a spring, how to test it to make sure it's safe for consumption, and uh, all that good stuff. So. Um, Daniel, can you give us a little preview about what you're going to be talking about this evening? Well, tonight's talk is called Cleanse, and it's about cleansing your body during times uh, like ours that we're in now with this increasing pollution, whether that's pharmace pharmaceutical pollution or industrial petrochemical pollution or radioisotopic pollution like we know is all around us. And really what I'm going to do tonight is give people a strategy, a very well laid out strategy that they can keep themselves cleansed consistently without having to going to, uh, resorting to like very extreme cleanses like a lot of people do that tend to strip the body down and run the body down. So in the last couple decades, people have been doing all of these different sort of extremist diets and extremist cleanses, trying to keep their bodies clean. I think there's an easier way. I'm going to present that to people. And really what it's about though, my belief that that idea, those kind of strategies will be part of the generation, the patterns, the behavior patterns of the generations who actually make it through this interesting bottleneck we're going through in civilization right, right. now. In other words, people who don't take on practices like these, at least ones like these, I don't think will be represented in the gene pool over the next su the successive generations coming. So this is a talk tonight about getting your own body healthy, but also for your posterity so that your genetic lineage can actually be represented in the future world, which is going to be increasingly polluted for some time. Daniel, how does this information you're bringing fit in with the spring water picture here? And spring water is kind of the linchpin of the whole idea, honestly, and I'm sure you know that, but, but here's why. Um, I like to give an analogy of the human body as a fish tank, and I say it's like an aquarium. If you've ever had an aquarium in your house, you know that while the food that you feed is important, while the quality of the lamp that puts light into the tank is important, you know, while the quality of the bubble or putting, you know, oxygen into the tank is important, mm -hmm. there's really nothing there more important than the quality of the water. Mm -hmm. In other words, if we have very poor quality water in an aquarium and we have very high quality fish food, it's almost not going to matter how high quality the food is mm -hmm. if the water's not good. Now, we know ourselves to be, say, at elderly ages, maybe 55, 60 percent, 65 percent water if mm -hmm. we're a little bit younger. Mm -hmm. If we're quite young, maybe even up to 90 percent water as infants. Yeah. That water, of course, is made out of whatever water we're taking in from our habitat. And that water is increasingly polluted, again, with things like pharmaceuticals, um, with things like fluoride, with things like chlorine. Uh, these kind of toxins and antibiotics get into our body and become part of our tissue matrix eventually. So um, it occurred to me years ago to start visiting different springs and actually gathering my own spring water. And what I've really realized since then, I think as I've matured with that, is essentially this. The water that's locked in aquifers, which is the water that we access when we go to a spring. That water, when it bubbles to the surface, has been underground for quite some time. It's difficult to ascertain how long, but usually we're talking about hundreds or thousands of years. Well, if the water's been underground even hundreds of years, that means that water was underground before human industrial pollution really mm -hmm. existed in any serious way. Mm -hmm. So when we access that water, you're essentially coming in, into contact at the source of the spring with the cleanest substance left on Earth. That's amazing. It's powerful because the water that's on the surface of the earth is incredibly contaminated. So if we went to any surface water anywhere in the world and we brought it to a laboratory and we checked it for radioisotopes, they would, they would show up there. We would see residues from the over 2,000 nuclear warheads that have been detonated mm -hmm. on the earth. Mm -hmm. We'd see residues from Chernobyl. We'd see residues from Fukushima. Mm -hmm. um, these things are now in the water. However, when we get this underground water, it's not there. So I guess the real good news is you have the opportunity to make somewhere between 65 and 70 percent of your body out of the cleanest substance remaining anywhere on the planet at this time, which means whilst most people are sort of sacks of polluted water moving through polluted environments, yeah. we have the opportunity, if we tune into this idea, to actually be uh, made of very clean and clear water. And that, I think, really has deeper implications it really makes us agents of change because we actually become something clean in a world that's really increasingly polluted. Definitely, definitely. So Daniel, I come in contact with a lot of people on a daily basis that are wondering about tap water filters. And some of these filters claim to ionize and alkalize the water and, and microcluster it and take away the chlorine and the fluoride. And if you were looking for really the best water that you could find, why would you still take the time to go out into nature and to fill up glass jugs? 
let's look at water like sort of hierarchically, if you will. Let's say that the worst quality water imaginable that most people are consuming. So of course we could find, you know, the worst water imaginable is probably behind Monsanto's Roundup Ready factory. <laughs> but yeah. barring that, let's say that the tap water in most cities would be sort of our starting point. That's sort of the lowest quality water people in our culture are consuming. Yeah. I usually call it muni water as in municipal or tap liquids, tap another liquid. joke that yeah. I'll use. Uh, just to bring attention to people, hey, this isn't really water, this is water that's been changed. Yeah. And of course we know there's contaminants in there like urine, like feces, like toilet paper, like tampons if we live in major cities. Mm -hmm. If we're outside the city, we're still looking at things like chlorine and often in many cities fluoride. I hear recently this area of the country is, is taking the fluoride out of the water, uh, which I think is really great. But of course those things are in there. So that to me is sort of the low end. Any filter from there is going to make a qualitative difference. However, when we look at the kinds of filters that are available, the most basic filter would be the kind, those carbon block filters that a lot of people use. Yeah. And those just don't take very much out of the water. That's a great filter if you have good quality water to begin with. Mm -hmm. But when you're looking at very small molecules, uh, very small ionic compounds, things like fluoride and pharmaceuticals just pass right through those filters. So Definitely. they give an illusion of filtration, but they're not doing much filtration. Carbon is a fantastic filter, but not in these applications. Mm -hmm. Once we stage up from that, we're looking at things like distillation, mm -hmm deionization, mm -hmm. desalination, mm -hmm. and or um, reverse osmosis, which is a form of distillation, essentially a mechanical distillation. Now those four processes have all been implicated in a lot of disease processes by the WHO now. Mm -hmm. So the World Health Organization says, look, we're really concerned about countries that are using this type of filtration because they seem to demineralize the body, they seem to lead to damage to the blood vessels, they seem to be implicated in um, lots of different conditions when they're, long, when they're used for long-term consumption. Please keep in mind that filters like reverse osmosis and distillation they were not developed for drinking water and they were developed for industrial purposes in other words if you're in the old school photography business and you use uh, water in your process well you don't want a water that's going to leave films and residues on your equipment and so you need a distilled water mm -hmm. that wasn't developed for drinking it was then turned out into the drinking water industry mm -hmm. and there was a time where people believed pure water would be pure h2o molecules would be the better thing to drink now it turns out no, that's no not necessarily true mm -hmm. for those people who that's their only option currently who haven't accessed any other underground water sources if you do use processes like that it's important that you do something to try to remediate the demineralization of that water because mm -hmm. things not just pollutants are taken out essential salts what we call electrolytes electric um, uh, current um, passing molecules yeah. so it's important to add something back like maybe like a, a bit of salt mm -hmm. something like that to some read trace minerals, yeah some trace minerals that would add ions back mm -hmm. now I think the next stage up in that hierarchy after filtered waters would be waters that come from artesian wells. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have access to a drilled well, and I don't mean a dug well where you have a hole in the ground and polluted water seeps into it, yes. uh, mm -hmm. unless you live in a very pristine area where the, the watershed's clean, mm -hmm. you want a well that's been drilled down and it's essentially sort of like an artificial spring. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to get the same quality of water out of one of those that you would get out of a spring mm -hmm. and that's why we see a lot of these artesian wells tend to be high in sulfur and they'll have that eggy odor, they're high mm -hmm. in iron and they'll leave a rust. They're not ready for consumption. They're, they're not, I like to say they're not ripe and for a lot of people that's challenging because they haven't thought about water so much exactly. but essentially these waters haven't dropped those ions yet. Mm -hmm. um, they've been brought to the surface a little bit too fast through too straight of a column mm -hmm. and a little too early. Mm -hmm. So my favorite water of course is spring water mm -hmm. and so that's why I choose to visit springs. That's why I created my database findaspring.com mm -hmm. and have offered that to the public as a, a means of finding springs around you. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the greatest water in the world and it's difficult to explain until somebody goes to a spring and actually drinks that water mm -hmm. and feels for the first time what hydration's like. Because yeah. essentially most people are living in a chronic state of dehydration totally unaware of that. Mm -hmm. They don't realize how thirsty they are. They've just learned to live with it.